I'm here at Porkfest with Bruce Fenton, who is the founder of Atlantic Capital, longtime crypto investor. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Thank you. Good to see you. This is for my series on what is blockchain. So let's start with that question. What is blockchain? So a blockchain basically is a series of blocks that are validated by peers, which say something that is true, like a ledger. That's the simplest way I would describe it. Basically a better ledger. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I would call it. And if you were to describe that to a child, like what's the essence of, of blockchain? For me, it's something that says what is true. And instead of having some certain person or party say what's true, you have a whole bunch of people who validate a long chain, which is called these blocks in the blockchain to say, this statement's true, this statement's true, the previous one. So you're basically having people validate what's true rather than relying on a certain trusted central party like a bank to, va to validate what's true. How did you first get involved and why did you get involved? Well, I first got involved because of this community, the Liberty community, actually. That's where I first heard about it. When I started, pretty much almost everybody in the community was some sort of libertarian or activist or anarchist or something mm -hmm. like that. And then and then it, it changed over time as more people entered. But in those days, it was, it was very much about this community. I've always been interested in emerging technologies and I've, I've been very interested in economics and free market economics because of my job growing up on on wall street and so the the merging of technology and economics was was what grabbed me on it for sure what do you think is the most exciting tech to come out of blockchain tech like what's the most exciting application probably bitcoin bitcoin because it's the potential to disrupt global money and become uh a new major form of money, maybe even some sort of global reserve currency. I think that's really has very far reaching impacts. So I, I think that's pretty excited, exciting. I'm also excited about some of the other applications like from Wall Street, you know, tokenization of securities and that kind of thing is pretty interesting as well. And what makes you interested in those things? Do you think it's going to give an upheaval to the financial industry? Yeah, I think so. And I'm always careful to say, you know, maybe it won't be Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin has a great lead right now and I certainly put uh, you know, a lot of effort into Bitcoin more than anything else, but um, it's still pretty early. So who knows what it, what it may be? But but Bitcoin or some Bitcoin-like technology uh, has a very good chance, I think, of becoming a major global currency. In your opinion, what gives Bitcoin value? With any money, what gives it value is when people want to use it and hold it and b b feel that it has value. As, as simple as that sounds. Uh, and there's a lot of great writing and. Uh, research that people have done long before Bitcoin on what, you know, kind of what makes money. What, why would people use buttons or copper coins or gold coins or stones or shells or pictures of uh, dead authoritarians or whatever they choose? People use what is most scarce and what is fungible. And Bitcoin meets a lot of these properties that have been used by people for money for thousands of years, really. Do you think that there's an underlying use case outside of Bitcoin as a money? Definitely, it already is being used for other things. There are people who trade securities and other things using the Bitcoin blockchain. There's some advantages and disadvantages of that, but that'll be interesting. And there won't really be anything that anyone can do f to stop people from using Bitcoin for other purposes mm -hmm. other than money. What do you think the world will look like in 10 years time uh, now that we have blockchain tech, we have Bitcoin? Well, sometimes these things take longer than it than you think they will. With the internet, I, I predicted all the newspapers would be out of business by the early 90s, and that does, still hasn't happened. So you don't know- Why are people still buying newspapers? Right. Uh, th these things may be slow. I think central banks are here for a while, but we may have uh, a very different world in 10 years where people could have a lot more ability to control and hold their own wealth, and they will still be able to use custodians to hold their wealth, but it'll be voluntary. Whereas right now you kind of don't have a choice but to trust a custodian. So I think things will be, be moving a little bit easier, faster, and with people having more control. And, and in some cases, like currency, uh, particularly in some countries in the world, that's a really, really big deal. So it, it could be quite different from what we see now. Your background is in the traditional financial industry. So you must have seen a lot of change come in in the last few years as, as these people learn about blockchain tech, start applying it to traditional finance. What are the major changes you've seen? Well, it's been very interesting to see that Wall Street is interested in this now because when I started, even though I came from Wall Street, zero. 
I didn't know anyone uh, who was interested in this until I met Barry Silbert, who also came from kind of a, a Wall Street background. Uh, and that was probably 2012 or so. But so it's interesting now to see so many new big companies that are interested in this and see this as a potential uh, solution. And a lot of them are kind of wrong about it, too. So a lot of them are coming in and they're misunderstanding. That's also e equally interesting to me. What do you think some of the biggest barriers to mainstream adoption or increased in adoption that we've seen? And are they tech hurdles? Are they social hurdles, political hurdles? It's not super easy to use for a lot of people. People really like to have custodians. I mean, if you have $100,000 in cash, you can keep that as a bearer asset and you could put it under your mattress. And some people do that. But uh, most people would kind of prefer, well, you know, I'd like to, as bad as a bank may be, I want to put it there. Uh, so custody is, is, a, is a significant issue. And there's early adopters right right here who were here when, uh, you know, Eric Voorhees, Charlie Schramm and Roger Veer came right right here behind us six years ago and talked about Bitcoin when it was at four bucks. There's people here who bought it. They may have millions now. And when you, when you get into those amounts, the more you have, the more careful you have to be about security. So the security issues, the fact that it, it is so appealing for hackers and, and um, theft, or if you lose it, th those are significant issues. There's more and more ways to deal with that now, where you can, uh, you know, have it in multi-sig and multi-locations, but it's not super easy. You have to be a bit of a techie to really secure your money pretty well. Mm -hmm. So that's an obstacle. But I think there's a lot of companies and people working on that. Hopefully that'll be uh, solved. <laughs> It's really interesting to see how the culture has shifted over many years since uh, Bitcoin was first uh, created. Now, it started out with a cypherpunk route. Do you think that culture is important in the blockchain space and preserving some of that, those roots is important? Yeah, I wouldn't so much say culture, but good ideas are worth preserving. And the cypherpunk ideals are very good ideals. To me, it's one of the most important aspects of this because of the way that it can align incentives and you just simply publish code out there and people can use it. And all of the economic activity that comes about from that is sort of the secondary market and the and voluntary interactions between humans. It's actually really good from an economic standpoint about sharing incentives and values. So I think Preserving those kind of things are important. And being somebody who cares a lot about freedom, I think that it's important to remind people that this is where this came from. And it's fine if somebody's in this space to get rich or whatever their motivation is. Maybe they don't care about freedom or they think anarchists and libertarians are nuts, but uh, they are really aligned. So people should should carefully examine it. And maybe hopefully they'll, they'll realize these are good ideas and they'll embrace some of these ideas. If not, then maybe you know, they should reconsider crypto because it really is uh, closely tied freedom right. and, and, and uh, this whole movement. Absolutely. When you decentralize an industry, I mean, you're giving power back to a bunch of people rather than having centrally controlled power. So I think that these people who may not be traditionally aligned with these ideas, they're still implementing a very freedom giving technology, which is awesome to see that being applied to all different sectors. And they're giving away for free. Yeah. There's 550 some odd developers who've made contributions to Bitcoin and there's many, many other developers who've contributed to other projects and not only is it free for you to use in that application you can copy it change it use it for any other application which is pretty cool you said that bitcoin is probably your favorite implementation of blockchain tech but there are lots of projects going on in the space what are some of your other favorite projects I am uh, fascinated by a lot of projects. This is a very experimental space. And even in the case of Bitcoin, you could lose everything that you put in. Everything can fail. All of these projects could go down to zero. They are very, very, very risky. So I'm always very cautious about, about any of these projects. I'm interested in uh, a lot of the major projects. Um, you know, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, they all have advantages and disadvantages. I'm very active with Ravencoin, which is a smaller, newer project. Um, I like Monero. I'm interested in the the, the, the privacy aspects. Mimblewimble is, is a neat project, which isn't quite uh, out yet, but um, that also has privacy implications. Mimblewimble. I haven't heard of that one. I have yeah, to look it up. They, well, you know, one of the secrets I've had uh, is l trying to find the really, really smart people. Um, I was... Uh, smart enough to realize that I wasn't that smart early on, especially <laughs> in the areas What's that are... The Dunning-Kruger effect? Yeah, 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 that's exactly that. I, I know a decent amount about economics, and I know a ton about uh, the securities world, but that's really it, you know. Uh, you can't duplicate the kind of depth that uh, 
certain people have in computer science. It would take years and years and years. We have some of the best computer scientists in the world. So I try and find who the smartest people are and copy them. And a lot of the smartest people have been looking at Mimble Winnable and talking about it for a while. And they, they all have risks. Uh, you know, it's no, nothing's a sure thing for sure. And you're involved a lot with Ravencoin. What do you like about that project? So the use case of that is um, for an area that I'm interested in, it's, it's for issuing tokens. And tokens, I think, is kind of a killer app for blockchain. It's been very successful for Ethereum. Ethereum has some challenges. I like Ethereum a lot. I've been involved with that since the early days. But two, two big challenges. One, it's, uh, it's got scalability issues. And two, it's a bit centralized. They were able to do this DAO uh, fork to recover uh, funds that were uh, attacked. Um, those are two big negatives. And as big as a use case this token thing is, there isn't really a lot of projects that are specifically focused on that. Uh, you could say, okay, Bitcoin's the strongest chain, but it's really not designed for for tokens. So the theory with, with Ravencoin was that if you made a chain that's specifically focused on that, at least when those decisions come, maybe the community and the miners and the developers will be a little bit more likely to prioritize that really important use case because tokens could be a, a huge use case just as big as cash. It could be tens of trillions of dollars. Tokens can come in a lot of forms. They could be gaming tokens or gift certificates or airline miles, or they could be securities. I'm really interested in securities. So that's one reason I like that that chain, and it uses the the security of Bitcoin, which has been proven and tested. And there's a lot of extra development around Bitcoin, things like the Lightning Network, which work really well with this and can help solve scaling. So I think it's certainly an interesting experiment. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, I've, I've been active in, the, in it. I've, I co-authored one of the right papers. I was, uh, you know, in, 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 in been involved in it and working with the community. So I, I think it's exciting and it's fun. And it's, it's, a, it's a very cypherpunk uh, type of project. It has those aligned incentives. There was no uh, pre-mine or founder's shares or developer's shares or ICO or fundraising of any type, which is a harder road because nobody can get rich on it. They, It's given away. The developers uh, gave it away. Medici was very generous in that they donated time to allow developers to work on it, but they don't get anything in return for that. They have to take their own economic risk just like every other person. And I think that's important because when you get later on as something, if it's fortunate enough to work and mature, then... Uh, you don't really want to have that power structure where you, like you do with a lot of ICOs, where you have a CEO or a head or somebody who controls it. Uh, if something is to work and become a tr token platform, I think it has to be, um, you know, more on the decentralized side, copying the best practices of something like Bitcoin. Now, if blockchain were never invented, what would you be doing now? I would still be doing my financial business. Uh, you know, Atlantic Financial has been around for a while. I was always interested in emerging markets, emerging technology. I used to spend a lot of time in the Middle East and, uh, you know, traveling, giving kind of high-end economic advice to sort of, you know, decabillionaire type investors. That was what, what I did right before this. And, and it was kind of crazy, a big risk. I sort of uh, stopped accepting those clients, didn't renew contracts and sort of let that business um you know, decline so that I could focus on this. And now you're dealing with a different kind of decabillionaire client. <laughs> <laughs> They're not quite decabillionaire. My, my, my blockchain friends are not quite in the league of the clients I used to handle. But it's getting there now where I can bridge both worlds. Because when I started, the skills that I had for dealing with, you know, sovereign wealth funds and, you know, huge family offices and these kind of investors weren't really applicable. There wasn't really anything that you could put a hundred million into if you wanted to work in this space. So, but it is, it is at that stage now. Now you have really serious investors like Mike Novogratz and big institutions, Overstock, Medici, you know, really serious institutions that are working in this. So there's more things that I can do to kind of bridge those worlds, uh, which is good. What role do you think government should have in regulating the blockchain industry and Bitcoin in particular? Well, they should take a big list of everything they want to do and then throw it in the trash. <laughs> you know, um, they don't really have any business in this space. And we've we've become so beaten down by this this idea that you've got to you know, be a, a slave of some sort to this huge regulatory apparatus, which nobody really thinks does any good other than people who are either naive or misinformed or have never been in the actual industry. Bernie Madoff was head of the largest regulator in the United States. And if that's not proof that these regulations don't, don't protect people, I don't know what is. The fact is they just don't help. You don't save the people. So that, because that's the argument I get into a lot of people who, who want the regulation. They say, oh, you know, people are getting conned on ICOs. They don't know what they're doing. They're you have losing to protect money. them. 
yeah, if, you, if it would actually work, then we could have a conversation about it. And even then I'd say, well, you, you know, you're going to protect some, but you've got a lot of drawbacks. You know, like 300 million people killed by their own governments in the last century, <laughs> more, more people in prison uh, in the United States than any other country, uh, more people in, in prisons than, than Russia had in Soviet gulags. These are big drawbacks. And when you have people looking on online saying, oh, isn't that horrible that children are in cages or these police are beating minorities or how could this happen well it happens because people go and say there ought to be a law every time somebody's taking a nightstick to somebody's head it's because some well-meaning do-gooder went and said there ought to be a law or we ought to protect the people and it doesn't protect the people because you end up with this you know sort of captive apparatus that doesn't really help and just hires their friends and cronies and and carves out things for certain corporate cronies or other things. I would say a radical, crazy idea, which is let peace, people peacefully transact and do what they want. Because that's what, that's what it is about at the end of the day. It's about peace. Government is force. The difference between government and every other end organization is force. If it wasn't, if it wasn't force, it's a suggestion. I got no problem with a suggestion. If you want to create the, the ICO watchdog group and you want to go and preach to people, or you want to create the, uh, you know, like the religious police, like they have in Saudi Arabia, and they want to go and tell you that you're uh, wrong, but for not wearing a, a headscarf, great, go more power to you. But when you when you make it a law, it has to be enforced, and force is a, is a bad thing. Violence against peaceful people is bad is bad. And as simple and crazy as that is, I just say people ought to be able to buy and sell what they want. And if they want to buy a stupid token or a crypto kitty or a Bitcoin, they should be able to do that and inter interact and change with people without having somebody put a gun in their face or sick a dog on them or put them in a cage. And uh, as simple and as simple as that sounds, uh, it's not what a lot of people are following. So I. I I would urge people to, you know, really think about, you know, is it worth doing force and violence to people? I don't think it is. Yeah. To finish off, what do you see in the future for Bitcoin and blockchain? A lot of craziness, a lot of volatility, a lot of unexpected. It'll probably go down more than you think, go up more than you think. I think that overall, long term, the technology is really exciting right now. When I got into this space, I think there was maybe four or five developers actually working on this full time, certainly less than a couple dozen. Now there's thousands and thousands, and a lot of them are maybe fools or depending who you listen to, scam projects or whatever, but some of them are going to develop some good stuff. And, and, and even if five or 10% of the projects are good quality projects with good intentions, and even if only a few uh, percent of those succeed, that's still a lot of significant projects that are going to make a difference. I th so I think we're going to see a really exciting world. This is a better invention. The way that Satoshi put things together in the original white paper that kind of released this concept of a modern blockchain and what we call Bitcoin and all of this other stuff that came from that, that was a new invention. It was something that was done in a way that nobody else had done before. And the cool thing about inventions is that you can't uninvent them. So maybe all of this will fail. Maybe every coin, even, even Bitcoin will fail, but the invention still exists and you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. So I see this, this technology being here to stay. And I'm certainly believe that Bitcoin will do well and I believe that it will exist. But even if it doesn't, the technology is going to be here. And uh, that's really exciting for sure. Exciting indeed. Well, thank you so much for cool. chatting with me. It's been wonderful. Great. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Subscribe to the channel. Yeah, subscribe to Naomi's YouTube channel. <laughs> Best endorsement ever.